All right, welcome to the barn, all the people in attendance. Um, it's always good to see you guys' somewhat smiling faces, right? Um, you know, I've thought a lot this week. We've had some different things going on in, in my personal life uh, that really get me thinking and praying and about the barn, what it means, what it's all about. And I take near and dear to my heart, you know, what God has, has created out here, and I believe it to be really good. And it means a lot to me. And you guys do mean a lot to me. And, um, you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of take things for granted, right? But uh, in moments where you don't always understand everything that happens in life, and we don't need to. We trust God and chill, right? And I'm glad um, for you guys. And like this barn, like when me and Jamie started having conversation, I was thinking about, like, what is this place built on? And it was prayer to begin with, you know. Um, it was prayer. I was praying about, you know, where God might want me. And it led us, me and Jamie together, which then led us into other things. And, and prayer, the Bible, and fellowship is kind of like what's always driven us, right? And then relationships and you guys and your authenticity and I appreciate that a lot. And it helps me more than you guys even know. So I just wanted to start there. Um, and let me just pray, open us up, and then we'll go. Father, thank you for tonight. God, we love you. And we thank you um, for what you've given us. You've given us brothers. You've given us relationship. Um, but that doesn't mean things are always easy, God. And we are here to accept challenges. We are here to deal with issues um, in our personal lives, in our spiritual lives, in our relationship with you, relationship with others, God. Um, I pray this can always be a place where we can come and deal with those things with each other. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I appreciate everybody that's ever prayed for this ministry. I appreciate the men here tonight who pray for me the women's ministry who solidly prays for us continually and always and just wraps this place up with prayer, God. Um, it's all by your power, your grace, and your glory that any of us are even here. So we appreciate you, we love you, and we thank you. And I pray tonight as we study in Corinthians that your word, we know it won't return void. We know that your word always has a purpose and a place in our lives. And I pray that the message tonight, that we can receive it um, with humility and that it doesn't come off as painful, but comes off as learning, growing, loving each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so let's get into this. Tonight, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, with this, you know, there's things, anytime you go through the Bible, like a whole book, you cannot avoid some of the harder topics, right? Like if we were just going to topographical preach, we could always do sunny day, happy days, kind of keep it soft, keep it easy, keep it light. But one of the reasons that we're out here tonight is not to avoid challenge, right? And some of the, the passages tonight, depending on your situation in life, can be challenging. I mean, I've read the Bible now for a lot of years, and there are things in here that to this day challenge me directly, daily, right? There's things that I look at and I go, oh, like, you know, love your enemy. You're like, oh, okay, I got to forgive. I have to, like, there's things that depending on the season and what you've been through, and everybody in here has got a story about their life, which is awesome, because all that breeds into experience. And then how do we shape that and mold that through the Holy Spirit to work together with scripture to now become new creatures and continue to develop and let God develop and mold us and shape us for his glory and honor. So do never, never run from a challenge, okay? As men, we are called to face challenge. We are called to step up to challenge. And we will be challenged. We'll be challenged in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's at work. Sometimes it's at mar in marriage. Sometimes it's by another person. Sometimes it's going to be physically, mentally, emotionally challenging. And as men, we are called as godly men to not just run from challenge. Have an answer for the faith that you have. Be ready to anybody that comes to you. Be ready to have an answer for the faith that you believe, right? 
So tonight, as we go through this, I pray that we can all just have humble hearts and receive the word of God. Right? So let's just get into it. Now, regarding the question you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain, abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sex, uh, sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her husband's body uh, to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Now, this doesn't sound bad at all, right? It's like, okay, you get married. So the, the key here is marriage. Paul's like, okay, it's, it would be better if you don't even need to have sex. But if you burn for lust, some other translations would say, if you have lustful desires, like, I don't just expect you to walk through life and not get married, right? Because as men, we're all programmed a little different. And he will say in here, like, some of us have the gift of, like, we don't have, like, high libido, high sexual desire. Now, I don't know about most men in this room, but there is a point if you're burning with lust, he's like, get married, get a wife. And then inside of that, he says, hey, the wives are to submit their bodies to their husband and fulfill those sexual desires. Now, this comes with a caveat. So what do we think about sex? And what are our sexual desires? And how has our brain been programmed to have sex? Right. So most of us, myself included, I grew up understanding sex not as a holy union to consummate a marriage to become one flesh. I understood sex as a pleasurable action to get what I want, when I wanted it and how I wanted it. And then you watch porn for about 10 years, 15 years straight, and your brain really gets twisted into what sex is all about. Right. It's just like two animals. And you, and you completely take what God intended sex to be out of the equation, right? So in this passage, it's not saying, hey, because you can't control yourself at all, your wife needs to submit to your every woman need in the bedroom, and you have these fantasies that are twisted, right? That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that she needs to submit to every fantasy that you have in the bedroom. That's not cool. That is not loving your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it, okay? It also doesn't mean that if your wife is like you're not connecting with her, you're not nurturing her, you're not taking care of her, you're not being a husband to that wife, that you can just get what you want when you want. So let's keep going, and this will make more sense. But this is a good passage to start with because we are called to get into a union, a marriage union, consummate that with sex, and then enjoy sex continually. It's a good thing. Right? Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 7, Thank you. chapter 3, or verse 3. Chapter 7, verse 3. Uh, go to verse 5. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual imp intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Okay, so now we see a correlation between abstinence and prayer. And we talked about prayer. Prayer is the most underutilized vessel of the power of God that we have in the church I think like prayer is not a natural thing the flesh never wants to pray unless you're like in times of hardship and you're like oh God help me you know help me I need me 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 but prayer through the spirit with the Holy Spirit can become a very natural part of your life but it takes time and it takes intentionality to develop that me and my wife have been praying every night for a long quite a while now and I will tell you this, there are nights where I'm over there and I'm kind of like, eh, we, you know, we don't really need to do it tonight. And she'll be like, hey, are we going to pray? And I'm like, yes. And there's other nights where I'm like, hey, let's pray, right? So even like, I'm still like fighting. There's always something against prayer with your wife in your relationships that there's always going to be a target on that back. But we have to continue to be devoted to prayer. But through abstinence, it seems as though there's a connection there. And what this, what this connection is, don't forget who we're called to first. It's our Father through the Lord Jesus, right? So our first relationship, so many people get our relationships on earth so twisted because we expect things out of them that they can't fulfill. Because we have hard hearts and we want people to fulfill our needs, our needs, our needs. There's only one that's going to fulfill your needs. 
His name's Jesus. I've looked everywhere for fulfillment pre-Jesus. I looked everywhere. The bottle, sex, you name it, right? Fast life, money, fame, whatever it is, something to try to fill me up. But only through Jesus did I actually find true fulfillment and peace. And he sees me. He knows me. And I can have a relationship with him, right? So first, we have to, before you want great bedroom attire with your spouse, you need to be connected to the Father. You want that, if you want the bedroom to, to be a place that is special, it takes connection to the Father. Amen. That's it. And if you're not connected to him and you're asking your wife for it, now we're getting it out of order because now you're using her to fulfill your needs. You're needy. And as men, we don't like to admit it, but we can be needy, right? We need what we think we need, a lot of things. So the first relationship is always with God, always. So let's keep going. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because you lack your lack of self-control. Has anybody in here ever had issues with lack of self-control, <coughs> right? We're humans. We're in the flesh. The only the self-control is a fruit of the spirit of God. And I was just having a conversation with a guy in my office today about fruits of the spirit and how in our normal state, we have no shot without Jesus, the Holy Spirit. We have no shot to be self-controlled. Some of us have a higher tolerance and this is where we get things so twisted. So, and this is where I got it twisted for a long time. I have certain thresholds. Andy is, is, has higher thresholds for certain things than others. I'm not fast to anger. Like, I've never been real fast, like, quick to anger. So I can use that in, in Andy's power and be like, well, I have the fruit of the Spirit in that. But here's what God will do. He will put you in situations where your threshold gets surpassed. Right? <laughs> so I might be slow to anger naturally, but there's been plenty of times in my life where I've succumbed to anger. It doesn't happen as often as it does for maybe other guys. And even in that case, that's something that I would naturally be better at probably, but there's still a threshold. And once that threshold's hit, if I think I got that thing covered, when that threshold gets hit, that's how you get holes in a closet door, right? Because I think that Andy's got enough power to fulfill that part. I don't need God there as much as I need him here. We need God in every facet. So even if you're not quick to anger, or even if you're, you're not as lustful, we still need to call our God and utilize his power. Because the power of the Spirit is far more than us. The, the disciples are sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to go get crucified. He's sweating blood. Jesus comes back. He tells his disciples, devote yourself to prayer. Pray tonight. Don't sleep. Just stay up and pray. He's asking his disciples to pray. Because he knows what's about to go down. He goes back and what are they doing? They're sleeping. And Jesus famously says, the flesh is, is weak, but the spirit is able, right? So our flesh, in anything that we think we have power, we're fooling ourselves. The spirit of God has all power, okay? So don't be tempted into thinking, oh, I got this little area covered over here. I don't really need God in this area, but I do need him over here. No, we need God across the board, right? So that Satan, that you won't be tempted because of your lack of self-control. And this just goes back to, if you're filled with lust, get married. Like, that's a simple thing, right? Um, and also, with a marriage, does that mean you need to find a perfect wife? That's a good question, right? No, because there's no such thing as a perfect woman. There's no such thing as a perfect man. It's two imperfect people coming together. So if you can lay the groundwork and the expectations that we both need God, and then our relationship, we need to continue to grow together. That's the way marriage works. I say, um, go to verse 6. I say this as a confession, not a command, but I wish everyone were single just as I am, yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. Verse 8. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it is better that you stay unmarried just as I am. But if, you can't control, if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn with lust. 10. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband not leave, must not leave his wife. 
Now I speak, uh, I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the believing husband brings holiness to the marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are. So, he says, and, and this stems from what Jesus says, what God the Father says in the Old Testament, what the Lord says. God hates divorce, okay? God, in Malachi 2.16, God literally says, I hate divorce. The Pharisees question Jesus. Let's just go to the, the, to the divorce piece first. The Pharisees question Jesus because this is a hot topic and there's a lot of controversy with this in the church and with believers because divorce is a real thing. It happens. Like it's not something you can just put your head in the sand and say nobody's ever going to get divorced. It happens. And there's grounds for divorce. There's reasons for the divorce. So let's go to, go to Matthew. This will clear a few things up. Go to Matthew 19. Let's go see what Jesus says. Matthew 19, 3. All right, Matthew 19, 3, this is Jesus. Uh, some Pharisees came and tried to trap him, him as Jesus, with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for any reason? And then Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then, and this is the Pharisees saying in verse seven, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replies, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession in your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever, more, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, unless his wife has been unfaithful. Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, is it, not, is it better not to marry? 11, not everyone can accept this statement, Jesus said, only those whom God helps. Some are born as eunuchs, some have been made eunuchs by others, and some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. So Jesus is saying, the reason God gave Moses divorce was because of humans' hard hearts. So if we look at divorce as a whole, you can say at some point in there, there's hardness of heart, right? Because marriage is an ultimate self-denial exercise. It's the ultimate, not me, them, putting others ahead of yourself, right? And this is difficult. And I would say it's impossible without Jesus to do it in a way that God intended. It's impossible to lay your life down for your wife and love her as Christ loved the church is like a calling that is, is pretty intense, really. But Jesus said there is grounds for divorce. So now we see concessions. And why would God give a concession? If he hates divorce, why would he give concession? Because we live in a broken, sinful, fallen world. God understands this. And he understands that there's going to be people that come into a union and do not fulfill their obligation. In Jeremiah 3, God sends a divorce certificate to Israel because of her adultery. Because God says, Israel, you are, are the, the bride. I am the groom. And this is the same illustration that Paul will use later to explain Jesus and the church. He's the groom, we're the bride. It's this idea of union, coming into a one flesh relationship. Now with that comes obligations from both parties. True or false? True. With the hardness of heart issue though, and here's why we don't have, we have adultery, and then also it will go into, we just read, if an unbeliever wants to leave a believer, they're free to let him go, okay? So if there's an unbeliever, if there's a believer and an unbeliever, and the unbeliever's like, I want out, I want to go, they're free to divorce. They can let him go. 
The problem with it is sometimes when you start going into, well, maybe the believer just really wants to get divorced. And, and instead of being faithful and trying to work things out, they're like, yeah, no, they're an unbeliever and they want a divorce, so let's just get a divorce, right? And I know there's, I've talked to several guys who have, they've tried to work things out and tried to work things out and tried to work things out and the, and the spouse leaves. Pretty good sign of where they stand with Jesus usually, right? Now you say, what if, what if 20 years ago I got divorced and I wasn't a believer? Well, was that a, a holy union at that point? Was that consummated with God? Did you even understand what marriage was, right? So there's a lot of things to unpack and there's a lot of ways to kind of work around this. And there's a reason people dance around this a lot because it's not popular. Like when you hear like Jesus would say, like if, if a man divorces his wife and gets remarried, then he can't get remarried. If he does, he's committed adultery. And this would be, they asked him, is, what are, is it, can a guy divorce his wife for anything? So if a guy says, oh, I like her better than her, and he divorces his wife, when he goes and joins with that woman, this wife over here was his partner, right? And as Christians, if we are going around and just divorcing left and right, because this was common practice with the Jews, it's like, oh, I don't like her anymore. She said something bad about me. Because to be honest, back then, if a woman committed adultery, guess what happened to her? She got killed. So it's like, whoa, right? So Jesus is getting tested by the Pharisees. And what he equates this to is a hardness of heart. The reason you're divorcing as much as you are is because your heart is hard. You're not trying to work things out. You're not in this the way God intended you to be in this. And it's the same reason God says he's going to send Israel a divorce decree. Because Israel's what? Adultery and hardness of heart. So it's a heart condition. Right? So if your heart is sincere towards God and you are putting everything that you can into a marriage and you're trying sincerely and you're not making excuses and it doesn't work out and they want to leave, there's grounds for that. So I would say the two grounds, if adultery, if somebody sins against you and commits adultery, you can get remarried. And this is something that you got to pray about too, right? Also, if it's an unbeliever and they want to leave and you can't, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. They can go. You're, you can't force somebody in because it says to keep peace, right? But with all this said, remember, your number one relationship is with him. And that's why Paul's like, it's better if you weren't even married. But if you burn with lust, get married. Because with marriage comes a lot of different responsibilities. Now you're, you've got to take care of your wife. You have a lot of obligations that aren't focused on what? The kingdom of God. Because it's easy to put your wife ahead of God. And every time that happens, it's a recipe for disaster. Because now you're trying to fulfill all of her desires. Then you feel like you're not getting your end of the bargain. And then it's a tit-for-tat thing. That doesn't work well. So, and there's also a passage in Luke 16, 18 you can look up. It's similar. Jesus is basically um, giving grounds. So, divorce stems from a hardness of heart. So does everything else. Right? It's our hard heart towards what God wants us to do and who God wants us to be. We are called to lay our lives down. We are called to no longer be so concerned about us and getting ours. And the only way a good marriage works, in my experience, and in many other guys' experience, is if you don't make it so much about you, but really consider your wife, love her, and go from there. All right, so let's break up into groups. And um, with this, because it is a tougher teaching, and that's okay. It's not meant to all, you know, be sunshine and rainbows. With the hardness of heart issue, how do you perceive relationship, right? With a hard heart and you're going into a relationship, where can we make it less about us and more about them? First with God. Second, if you're married with a spouse, if you're unmarried, you can tie it into another relationship because we're called to serve, not to be served, right? So where are we continually, God served me, God served me, God served me, God served me, and where are we, honey, serve me, honey, serve me, honey, serve me? Does that make sense? Just break up into groups and I'll repeat it. Are you guys in your groups? <coughs> Nobody's moving. I'm beginning to get concerned. 
Nobody wants to talk about this hardness of heart. I don't have a hard heart. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right, so we're talking about hardness of heart. What's up, Shep? How's it going, Shepard? Hope everybody's good tonight. Um, you know, some of the teachings in the Bible are not always the easiest thing of all time, but they're things we have to work in. What's up, Dr. Don? Um, and this life is not perfect, and sometimes we want it to be, and we want to try to control situations and control other people, but we have to get in tune with God, right? Without the Holy Spirit, man, we got no shot. We got no shot, and we're going to make mistakes. Um, thank God that we aren't judged on our mistakes. You know, if we have a repentant heart and we, we can take credit for our shortcomings, ask for forgiveness in these relationships, but it still doesn't mean that they're always going to work out, you know? And there's grounds where we want to try to work it out, we want to try to work it out, but there's times where no matter what you do, you cannot control the other person. We do not want to put ourselves in a position where we use biblical grounds for separation to just like not even try to work it out, not exhaust resources, prayer, and do what, do what we can with God to try to work these relationships out because God, what God has separated or joined, let no man separate, it's, it's serious. And I know a lot of people, I, there's a lot of people that have been through this and it's difficult, you know? First love has to be him. Yep, that's right, Don. Um, and and that's where you can have peace um, in situations that are difficult, right? Because man, there's going to be difficult situations that arise, and that's where we really just continue to lean on God, continue to pursue Him. You know, we want to do what's right by God, but even with a sincere heart and everything headed that way there's still going to be conflict. There's still going to be issues, right? And we can resolve those to the best of our ability. And that comes with forgiveness, um, with love, loving the, another person, you know, forgiving them in our heart, asking Jesus to help forgive people, and also to ask forgiveness where we've sinned against people and where we've done them wrong and where we've, you know, our pride's gotten the best of us and where we're hard-hearted. Um, a lot of the times the ego, like my ego or my pride, is what makes me hard-hearted. What's up, Kevin? Be the servant, be the light. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and pride is, is something that will harden our heart. You know, we want to be right. We think that we know what we're doing. We think we got the answers. Um, but a lot of times when we think we know it all, we really know nothing. And the more that you understand God, the more you see Him, the more that kind of rings true. Yeah, definitely edging out God. Anytime the ego gets involved, you know. Or, you know, we try to control. We want to resolve the solution with our man-made tactics. Well, if we just do X, Y, and Z, let's try that. And, and what we'll do is this, that, and the other. And then we go down a long stream of, like, we never really get anything done. And maybe it works for a minute or a little bit, but that didn't really get to the problem. The problem is our heart, the hardness of our heart. And if you can get two people on the same page, it's a beautiful thing. But you're not always going to have both parties on the same page. And daily, in marriage, like some days my wife has to forgive me more. She has to be more patient with me. She has to be more gentle and loving. Other days, it's vice versa, right? So it depends on what we're going through and, and how it's going. But um, nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect in this life. Uh, but thanks, thanks to Jesus, he redeems us. And he redeems situations. And he can supernaturally change us and charge us up. Looking within, total surrender, yep. Absolutely. Yeah, every day we need to be aware. What's up, Austin? Move 
faith relationship as I'm growing stronger in my faith. That's one thing that I need to be more conscious of. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you got to be who you are in Jesus. And to be authentic, the only way I've found that I've ever really been authentic is understanding who I am in, God, in Christ, right? So I've walked this world with a lot of masks on, and I've talked about this before, being this guy over here, trying to get accepted over here, and, and doing that, and it becomes very difficult because your identity is spread across too many platforms, right? One identity, the reason we were created was to worship, love, and serve God. And once that, that identity gets solidified, then you can just be who God wants you to be, and you can give Him glory and honor. And whatever people around you are kind of thinking or inspiring or doing, you can be at peace with. Because you want to be right by God. You want to do what's right by God because you love God first. And if He's your first love, everything else gets a lot more clear. Everything else gets easier, right? Um, with identity and understanding that, you know, if God really loved you enough to send his son down here to die for you, you he can take care of you. If he really rose from the dead, we're about to go into Easter, uh, Sunday coming up, if he really rose from the dead, your problems are minuscule in comparison to that, but it's hard to see on a daily basis. Just like uh, what James said, it's, it's an everyday thing. Pick up our cross, deny yourself, right? So, you know, these conversations, the cool thing about the Bible is if you just continue to read it, a lot of the answers, the Bible answers the Bible, right? So if you have questions on things, keep reading. So I got a hair or something going on. Um, keep reading, keep going, keep engaging, and the Bible answers the Bible. Now, some of these topics, you can see counsel, you know, ask your pastor. Um, ask somebody, but if people aren't giving you answers from the Bible, watch out. Like we want, we want people who are going to be answering these challenging parts of life through God's word, right? Not just on, you know, well, well I think what's right is X, Y, and Z. That's not going to get you anywhere because everybody's got an opinion on something, right? And there's going to be situations that are that come up that are going to be more difficult, but we can always revert back to the Bible. The Word of God has stood the test of time. And to this day, in 2024, it speaks right into the heart of man, dividing the bones and marrow. The Word of God is like a double-edged sword, dividing into the bones and marrow of a man, because it speaks to the conscience that God's put into us because we're made in the image of God. So the word of God never returns void. If we open up, open it up, and by faith, continue down the journey, it's like he will continue to teach us and grow us into these conversations. So as men and women, all of us people of God, when challenging or hard things come, we don't have to be concerned. We don't have to be worried or fearful. We have a God who's already done all the hard, challenging things that we really need. So now we can look at a challenge and we can say, this is a time where I can, I can grow. Because it's through trials that God grows us, right? And it's through the tough understanding. Sometimes the Bible's not gonna tell you what you wanna hear, but it's gonna tell you what you need to hear to, for, for you to grow into who God wants you to be. We can accept it and receive it with humility, or we can deny it and shuck it off and move on, right? And the, and the cool thing is it covers a multitude of topics. There are some things in Scripture that are kind of left up for discernment. And if you're a type A personality, you're like, oh, just tell me what to do. I'd love to just, just tell me exactly what to do in this exact moment, right? But that would take out the need uh, to be in tune with the Spirit of God and to be listening and, and prayer and praying about things. Um, and understanding and that's something that you know probably in the last week I've been I need to get more in reliance on prayer um, and continue to grow in my prayer life 
with God because it's something that I can take for granted, you know? I, can, I take a lot of things for granted, and it's easy to do as we get busy. Yeah, the Bible absolutely helps the heart. It's speaking directly to you. Directly to you. about another minute, another minute. Another minute. So the next topic we're going to get into here has to do with your bot at a high price, which is kind of what we were just talking about. So when you, when you think about what God's done and the price that was paid for us to be free men spiritually and to be back in a relationship with the Father, you were bought with a high price. It wasn't like, you know, you weren't on layaway, right? You were bought at a very high price um, because the value of that relationship is significant. Kevin, I need to call you, by the way. Completely slipped my mind. My bad, dude. Um, all right, all right. Let's get back into it real quick. Derek, Derek, taking out the light. Okay, so real quick, we're going to hit up another verse in 1 Corinthians 7, um, and then we're going to jump to chapter 8. So this is, a, this is something to remember for all of us. Um, in 1 Corinthians 7, if you go to uh, verse 20, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 20. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free in the Lord, the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. God paid a high price for you, so do not be enslaved by this world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. So a lot of times, you know, if somebody comes to Jesus... And the current circumstance that they're in, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a job, maybe it's, you know, um, a, a, a social status. Maybe you've been downtrodden and you're, you're kind of feeling like you're at the far bottom of the barrel of society. Or you feel like you're enslaved to the highfalutin society through business and work. And it's like, man, now I'm a follower of Jesus. Ah, it's hard. I don't, what are these guys going to think of me, Right. I know when I, when I first really came to Jesus, the biggest fear that I see most men have when they come to Jesus is what's my life going to look like now with all of my surrounding people, be it at work, be it in relationships, be it my marriage. Like it can be a very concerning thing. Like everybody's going to think I'm crazy. They're not going to respect me. They're not going to appreciate me. They're going to think I've lost it. They're going to call me a Bible thumper. Like I, I was never supposed to be a Christian. I was the guy who didn't like Christians. I was the guy who always thought, oh, those Christians are weak. They're soft. They need this God to get them through life. la di da di da That was me to a degree, right? I would respect God to the outside. But there was always a part of me that's like, that Christianity, like, that's good for you. I remember like when, when this was, I think when Tim Tebow was with the Gators. And this was like, pre-Andy following Jesus. I was like, you don't need to do that on the field. 
Like that Jesus guy. Now I'm like, yeah, let him be known, you know. And that's the transformation that Jesus brought in my life, right? So with that, though, it says, remember to remain as you are when you're called. So it's not like you come to Jesus and all of a sudden you got to change everything in a hurry. And now it's like, I got to find a new job and I got to find a this and I got to get a new wife because this one's not a believer. Slow down, right? Or I got to become a pastor and I got to go to seminary and I got to, and I got to, and I got to, and I got to, right? Hey, whoa, slow down, right? So it's like, boom, take a deep breath, enjoy your union with God first. Amen. Like the first thing you do if you're a newer believer or you just came to Jesus or you're redeveloping that relationship or starting to rekindle and get the Holy Spirit working and you start feeling a little fire start lighting under your rear and you're like, man, this is kind of great, right? Enjoy that. Soak it up. Use that fuel because you're understanding the gospel to dig into scripture, to pray, to do these things, to start working on treating others well. Maybe it's at work, maybe wherever it is. And let the Holy Spirit start transforming and working on you and God will open up the doors if doors need to be opened. So don't fret so much about where you are or man, you know, or if you came from like a, uh, uh, you know, once you come to Jesus, you get rich and famous, like slow that down, <laughs> right? That's not how this works. But what you want to feel is that inner freedom. And when you feel like that inner freedom, that no matter what circumstance you might be in, that you're a completely free man and you can just say, praise God. I'm a free man. No matter what circumstances I'm living in right now, no matter what chaos is ensuing around me, no matter what people think about me, I'm with you, Lord. And this is awesome. And that's where it's like, yeah. And then I can walk through my day and I got a smile on and I'm walking through there and I'm like, what's up? How's it going? You know, and they're like, oh, you know, it's, just, it's really rough. I'm like, oh man, sorry to hear that. Can I pray for you? And they're like, whoa, you know? Like we, we, we I like that culture. You know, we got, we had a guy pray for a guy at work today. It was awesome. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> but that, that idea of freedom, no matter your circumstance, because as well as some of us know, like financial freedom isn't really freedom. It's like everybody wants this financial freedom, financial freedom. What that really means is you want security. You want financial security. You want to not have to worry. What if you could be free under the circumstance of worry? Because if you're not, eventually, even if you make enough money to not have to worry about money, there's other worries. There's plenty of other concerns. Money only solves money problems, right? But sometimes it's good to be under the heat a little bit, to get in that fire, to be like, man, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my next mortgage payment. That's real worry, right? I got a family provided to provide for. I just lost my job. Crap, I don't feel like a man. I don't feel like I'm doing what I should. So let's fight and let's strive and instead let's be free. Let's be free of that worry and concern and show up with a great attitude and go get after it with, with the Lord, you know? And that's where you can be free, completely free of what people think. So I encourage you, it, it, it's not the easiest thing. I prayed for boldness for years, years. I was like, oh, I need to be bold. I'm a little scared little bunny puppy about this stuff. And still to this day, it creeps in, right? It's like, well, I don't know. Should I bring up Jesus on this deal or not? You know, it's like, I don't know. My like, God, you show me what you want me to do. And sometimes I listen and sometimes I don't. And when I listen, cool. When I don't, I'm like, well, God, I hope you give me another opportunity. And lo and behold, he does, right? Because he's faithful, even when I'm not. All right, let's go to chapter eight. So you're bought with a high price, no matter where you're at or what you're coming from. Jesus was the most significant price ever paid for anything in the history of all humanity and the universe and eternity. It's God sacrificing his son. I mean, if you think you're worthless, look at the cross. That right there tells you, you ain't worthless. You were bought with a very high price. He didn't get that on layaway, right? There's no 99 cent special. So, eight. <coughs> Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. So this gets into some very real world, real applicable stuff for Christian men. So let me summarize the first part and then we'll read the second half. They would sacrifice meat to other gods, right? And this meat 
they were debating, should it be eaten or should it not? And Paul basically comes to this conclusion. There's no other gods. These are all just made, made up images. Like they're all made up. Like they might have a demonic spirit behind them, but the actual idol that they're sacrificing meat to has no power. So there's nothing to it. It's just food. Like food's for the belly. It goes in the belly. And then you know what happens after it goes in the belly, right? And Jesus makes the same analogy. But it's what comes into the spirit, into the heart of a man. And this is why we're called to guard our eyes, right? So what we're eating really doesn't matter that much. But what we watch and these things matter. So then with that thought, Paul basically says, yeah, it's no big deal. You can eat meat sacrificed to idols because it means nothing. It's meaningless. But if a brother thinks it's meaningful... Now we got a different scenario here. So let's start in verse 7. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, if they think of it as a worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated, little g gods, see, um, are violated, it's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it. We don't gain anything if we do eat it. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of idols, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes an, a believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. So this covers a multitude of things. Alcohol, what we watch on TV, music we listen to, outside books we read, some, all sorts of things. So if you know that somebody struggles with something, and this happens at the Christmas party at work, this happens at the holiday parties, this happens at your house on the weekends, this happens in a lot of scenarios, and you might not struggle with alcohol, and this is one that's just, I think, pretty prevalent. If you don't struggle with alcohol, and you're cool, you have a beer or two, no sin, you're not drunk, but if a brother comes over who has battled with that, the entirety of their existence, or even at any point in their life, and he sees you as a Christian man, especially if they look up to you at any degree, and even if they don't, and he's like, oh, well, Andy, you know, he cracks a couple beers. He's a, he's a godly man, so I'll crack a couple beers. And then that guy goes on a bender for a month, two months, two years, three years, because now we just gave him the okay that if Andy can have some beers and he's a godly man, why can't I? You just absolutely poured gasoline all over that fire, right? So be careful, be wise about, you know, what you do around who. And it's okay to ask people. Like if you have brother, like a brother comes to your house, you're like, hey man, like do you at all, are you tempted by alcohol? Do you struggle with alcohol? Because I don't want to put anybody in a position. That would, and they'll say, no, no, I'm good. But if you know better and they do, like just don't do it. It's better, like, you don't gain anything by drinking. You also don't gain anything by not drinking. It's not like it makes you a holier than thou if you don't drink, right? Like, I don't drink because in my past, I drank a lot. And it was never the 12th or 15th beer that got me. It was always the first. But once I was ready to have a good time, it was going down, right? That's just my mentality. That's the way I was. But now, now I, I, I by the grace of God, I have not been tempted by alcohol. And that's 100% God. Because I tried to, you know, manage it and do all this. But if I know a brother, and I don't drink for that reason and my testimony. Because if people see me drinking, that gives them a green light. And I know the destruction that it causes. Because it caused a lot of destruction in my life. Same way with what we watch, like, on TV. You know, if we promote movies that have lustful scenes and a brother struggles with lust, not a good scenario. Or if we take lightly how we speak about our wives and a brother he is tempted to speak poorly of his wife, the next thing you know, you're in a golf cart and you just like bashing wife time. Like that's not cool, right? Gossip. 
If a brother struggles with gossip and I start, well, you should hear what happened over here. Oh, and then it's on like Donkey Kong, right? And the next thing you know, you're talking about this dude behind their back for an hour. That guy's not there. Like, what's the, like, what are you trying to prove? This guy's defenseless, you know? You're just nailing him up against a, a wall and beating him up with a billy club, and he's out probably enjoying life a little bit, doing something, you know, maybe he's worshiping God, and you're over there just like, yeah, well, you should have seen what he did. Blah, 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 blah. So there's lots of scenarios, and we're all guilty in this regard. I'm guilty in this regard. I've been guilty. Uh, swearing, right? If we use, we don't curse people with the same mouth that we praise God with, that doesn't make sense, right? So some guys, they've come from backgrounds where, man, <coughs> where they worked, whatever, their culture. I, baseball, we curse, we cuss all the time. But now, if I'm up here swearing, and a guy's like, well, you know, Fanny swears. What's wrong with dropping a few F-bombs? The point of the matter is with our mouth, like out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? With our mouths, we praise God. We honor God. We give glory to God. So we don't want filth coming out of our mouth and honor and glory. Does that make sense? Like, and then we're called to a higher calling because we're bought with what? The blood and a high price. So now that you're bought with a high price, phew, let's go. So get in groups. We'll do this little discussion about temptation. And where can we tempt another brother? And, and where do we have to watch out to not be tempted by another brother? Because whether we like it or not, not everybody's reading this passage tonight. Okay? Like a lot of times these passages, like you can't cover the whole Bible every day. You take what you got today, it's a reminder. Right? But where do we, where do we probably need to chill out and not tempt brothers with our behavior? And where are areas that we get tempted by brothers? Those are good to know. So that way we don't tempt each other. It's better just not do it. All right, go ahead and talk about it. All right, so talking about tempting each other, it's better to not do it than to tempt one another into sinning. We do not want to be the, the party that tempts people into sin. And we've all done it, but we have to be aware of it. Right? We don't want a brother to fall. We want to be there for him. And this is putting others ahead of ourselves. Yeah, pause before thinking. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Right? Um, so, probably where I've been tempted um, can be gossip. You know, it could be, it could seem like meaningless talk or like it's not gossip, but gossip, you got to be careful with. It is something that is easy to start talking about somebody else when they're not around. But if you have an issue with them, brother, go to them, right? Talk to talk, walk to walk. Um, music, right? So if I listen to... I don't know, maybe ACDC or something like that. And a brother has issue with that and they do not want to listen to ACDC or they, you know, for them, it's like, this is awful. And it depends on your relationship with music, I guess. Um, or new new Christian music versus old Christian music, hymns versus pop culture. Like, all this whole idea is like, be careful because if a brother, like, that's, that's a sin for them because of whatever it is, it's good to know that, right? And we don't want to put or put anybody in a situation where they they it causes them to sin or fall back into worldly things because we're bought with a high price that we don't have to fall into the trap of the world, right? Um, lust. I mean, there's there's those examples. Do you guys got any other examples? I kind of given all you know some examples that that I was thinking about. Words are very powerful. Yeah. Be careful with the words you speak. Really careful at work, at home, in the community. Yeah, yeah, because you know our words. Uh, James says, "Man has has learned to tame the animals, wild animals, birds, all sorts of things, but nobody's learned to tame the tongue." And that comes with self control, which is a spirit, uh, a fruit of the spirit. Self control over the tongue. Jesus says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." 
So if we're if we're taking in things of the spirit and we're, we're you know, igniting the spirit of God within us, our speech naturally will become better. It'll be more edifying. We'll we'll be quicker to understand like this isn't a scenario where I need to say anything on this or stick up for somebody when they're not there or you know say you know I don't feel comfortable with this conversation and those that makes people uncomfortable you know if you say I'm, I don't feel really comfortable with this conversation the way it's headed um, but those are things as godly people we can do you know with the spirit of God because if we're not encouraging and edifying people and not you know wanting what's best for them what are we really doing as Christians? Um, and training and teaching and encouraging and growing. So I hope these things were helpful tonight. The um, Yeah, watch what you do when you're around. If you're a Christian and you claim Jesus. Uh, and keep pursuing righteousness. And keep pursuing Him. Pursue His kingdom and, and righteousness. Seek Him and His kingdom. And all things will be added to you. Alright? Cool. So I hope... Uh, Everything's going well with anybody. Do we got any prayer requests? You can pray for me always and forever. Pray for my family, uh, to guard my family from temptation, from the evil one. Keep them for safety for my family. I'd appreciate that. Um, for me personally, just in my growth with, with the Lord. Um, and to keep me on track, right? To not let me be distracted by the things of this world, the things that are meaningless. I appreciate it, Kevin. I really do. Um, that means a lot. I've, I've learned, yeah, I used to not think I needed prayer. It's prideful. Um, I thought, you know, I could, I'll figure it out, no big deal. But thank you, James. I appreciate it. Um, but I need prayer. And I can see the areas of my life where, unbeknownst to me, people have prayed for me and it's made a ton of difference. The same way with the barn, like where people have prayed for the barn and for the work and the ministry and where it's made a difference. Like, you don't need to do, like, prayer is the most powerful thing that you can do. I love you guys. I hope you have a wonderful night. If you guys need prayer requests, go ahead and shoot them out. We'll go for another minute if you got a prayer request. Um, but we're praying for everybody, you know, and we'll blanket prayer, we'll individual prayer, but that's something we need to get good at and continue to see God and be fervent in prayer. All right, love you guys. Uh, Barn 45, out.